and you're live. Okay. So if you haven't figured it out yet, uh, I'm not Arsnake, and I'm not talking about right. polar bears. <laughs> uh, so that's what filled in here kind of the last minute, and uh, dug up this talk about uh, cryptography or penetration testers, which uh, should be a pretty, pretty interesting topic that doesn't get uh, too much attention, uh, but it's, it's a pretty uh, a very good uh, technique for attacking applications that uh, often gets overlooked. The idea behind the title is there's a, there's a class that uh, is taught at my alma mater, it's called Physics for Future Presidents. And the idea behind that is that you know, presidents need to know concepts about physics, but they don't need to know how to calculate like the acceleration of a ball dropped off the building. Well, the same sort of thing applies for cryptography. If you're a pen tester, you need to understand some really basic things about crypto and how it works and what to look for. You don't really need to understand so much about how it works and what the math is and the S boxes and rounds and things like that. Um, so the idea is you learn just enough uh, to, to be able to attack applications. That's what I'm trying to, uh, to cover here. So a quick background about me. I'm currently with Veracode. I'm running the research group over there. Previously, so I was consulting uh, for at stake and then semantic through acquisition. Uh, prior to that, a little bit of work with the NSA. So here's what we're going to cover today. And the talk was originally 75 minutes. Um, as, I, as I mentioned, I dug it up from, from an old presentation. So I'm going to try and fit 75 minutes worth of content into 45 minutes and replace a lot of words with pictures. So hopefully that'll help. Uh, we're going to go over a quick overview of uh, what the sort of problem is that we're trying to address here. Uh, do some crypto background, uh, talk about general analysis techniques for, for pen testers, and then go into some actual case studies from applications that I've tested in the past where some of these analysis techniques can be illustrated. Um, and, and I think a lot, a lot of it makes a lot of sense once you actually start to see the real data from the real applications and how easy it was to actually attack. So overview. How much do you really need to know about crypto in order to actually detect and exploit crypto weaknesses in web applications? Well, the answer is, as I kind of alluded to before, not a whole lot. Uh, you need to know a few basic things about cryptography, but you don't really need to know um, any of the math or anything beyond that. So the goal is today, uh, learn some basic techniques for identifying cryptographic data. So is it cryptography or is it not? Um, learn some black box heuristics for recognizing when a web application is doing something the wrong way or doing something in a weak, a weak fashion that we might be able to take advantage of. And then take some real world penetration tests and apply those techniques um, that we're learning about in a generic sense and apply it to the real data and see how those attacks actually come to fruition. Just a few warnings. Um, the talk is, is aimed at penetration testers. Um, if you're a developer, it might be interesting for you too, uh, but it is coming from the uh, the, from the perspective of, uh, you know, an offensive perspective. We're talking about how to attack these things from a, block, a, black box, uh, a black box scenario. I assume that you have an understanding of HTTP and common character encoding mechanisms that web applications tend to use, uh, Base64 being one of those. I assume that you have a little bit of understanding of cryptographic terms, uh, but none of the math. And we're going to review about five or six slides uh, that go over kind of that base crypto, just kind of as a refresher. And then uh, finally, the case studies that we're going to cover, which there are two of, are from real world applications, uh, real customer applications, but the data has been sanitized and you know, uh, names have been changed to protect the innocent and, and, and all of that. So the crypto that matters in six short slides, this is what penetration testers need to know, um, my theory anyway. Two types of ciphers, block ciphers and stream ciphers. One operates on blocks of data, um, uh, fixed length blocks of data, usually 8 bytes or 16 bytes at a time, come out a block. The block size is varied depending on the algorithm. So for example, you can have the same algorithm such as AES, uh, and, and you can use, uh, uh, it can support uh, different block sizes, um, different modes of operation. So it's kind of like, I want to use this flavor of DES, uh, if there are different modes that you can run the cipher in, it's still the same cipher, but uh, it changes the way that the, the different blocks interact with one another. And we have a kind of a graphic just describing that in a little bit more detail later. A stream cipher operates on uh, plain text one bit at a time. Um, so uh, 
the algorithm or the cipher generates a key stream, and then you take some plain text along with that key stream and, and combine those together, um, and, and you get cipher text. Um, and we'll get into this a little bit more later. I've listed some example ciphers there that you've probably heard of before, just kind of showing you which category, uh, high level category, that the, each one of them falls into. So, block ciphers. Um, we're going to talk about one particular mode of a block cipher, which is called the electronic codebook mode, or ECB mode. And this is, uh, this is a, a relatively weak mode, but it's the, simplest, it's the simplest mode that a block cipher can be, uh, be run in. Um, when you're using ECB mode, uh, every block of plain text is, is treated independently of all the others. So you take the plain text block, you run it through the cipher, and out comes, uh, you run it through the, the encryption uh, algorithm, and out comes the cipher text. And that's what we're showing there. Um, you can see there's no relation between the blocks. It just each block of plain text goes straight down into the, uh, to the cipher, and then out comes the cipher text. Um, uh, there are some weaknesses with this approach. Structure in the plain text is reflected in the cipher text. So what I mean by that is I take a particular piece of plain text, and I encrypt it uh, at, different, uh, at different locations within the larger piece of data. It's to show up as the same ciphertext every time. And that's illustrated there. Uh, assume that the two blue blocks are the same, the same data going in. Well, you're going to get orange coming out the other side, regardless of, of, of what uh, the neighboring data is. So if I change one block in the plain text, only one block in, in the ciphertext changes. I don't know if you caught that, but it was the one on the very left there that, that actually changed. Um, so the weakness here is, um, you know, obviously the, the pattern recognition of you know, one plain text is always the same ciphertext, assuming the same key, uh, but also ciphertext blocks can be modified without detection uh, because, again, because every block is, is encrypted and decrypted independently of one another. So we'll talk about a little bit, uh, a different mode here that tries to address some of those weaknesses, and it's called cipher block chaining mode. And in this case, you can see instead of just having that straight down uh, um, mechanism for each block where it just gets encrypted and out comes the ciphertext, now you've got, for every block that gets encrypted, the previous block's ciphertext is XORed with the plain text, and it, it actually feeds in to the, to the encryption for that next block. So what does it mean? It means when you change the message, yeah, that, um, it, doesn't, it doesn't just affect one block of ciphertext, it affects all the blocks of ciphertext that are subsequent to the change. Um, one other thing to notice here is, uh, unlike the ECB mode, we've got our two blue blocks of plain text. They don't encrypt to the same thing because of the fact that there are those blocks in between and they're actually influencing how that cipher operates. Uh, so now you don't have that pattern recognition anymore. If I change the contents of one of those plain text blocks, now look what happens to the ciphertext. It has a ripple effect. It changes the initial block that, that we're aligned with, and then that feeds into the next stage and changes the ciphertext there, which then feeds into the next stage. Um, so, so as you can see, it's, it's a much stronger mode uh, because 